uncertainty is so high, as already mentioned again by Dr. Comiso. And as well, in terms of governance, again, uh, the previous speaker, uh, Dr. McTeebai, also alluded to the role of, of uh, or the importance of governance and social understanding. It's not just science, but we have to communicate science in a way that is uh, easily understood. And of course, some of those uh, social capital, trust building, is also important. Now, our center, the Oscar M. Lopez Center, is very unique in the Philippines in that it is funded by private philanthropy. Our, shall we say, uh, you know, the, uh, the billionaires in this country, they realize that uh, climate change and climate risk is a real and present danger. And so they're putting their money where their mouth is. So the Lopez Group of Companies provided uh, like a seed money, like a grant. Uh, it's substantial, it's about $3 million for us to be able to do research on climate change. So this is a very unique uh, development uh, here in the Philippines. And the vision of the center is a climate resilient Filipino society. The vision of the center is to become a leading catalyst in terms of science-based solutions. So it's a science organization. It's not just advocacy, but it is based on hard science. The purpose of generating science-based solutions, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be a bit fast, time is so limited. There are two foci or focus of this uh, organization, of our organization. One is science, the other is sort of outreach, or reaching out or communicating. Just like a science organization, we do have a peer review journal. It's called Climate, Disaster, and Development. And if you are a scientist or in science, you can actually publish your papers here. The other thing that we're doing is the Philippine Climate Change Assessments. These are like the intergovernmental panel uh, IPCC assessment reports. Uh, and in fact, we were just uh, launching just last month and uh, just finished uh, with, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Lorenzo being part of this, the uh, second working group uh, report. We also look at uh, climate trends, what's happening with the climate in the Philippines. By the way, all of our reports are downloadable freely from our website. You can get it freely wherever you are. Uh, we also uh, you know, do a lot of these science uh, things. I won't go into details. This will probably bore you. But uh, you know, like flood mapping, uh, vulnerability assessments, using uh, technologies like LiDAR, satellites, remote sensing, you know, all these kinds of high-tech things. We're trying to uh, use these tools to generate uh, solutions. We've been partnering with uh, several organizations around the world University of, uh, you know, Lisboa in Portugal. We're trying to uh, start a partnership with Harvard University, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, uh, doing work resilience and, and, uh, and looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, how to, to address uh, climate and climate risks. We are, and also at the same time, trying to reach out, not just to scientists, but even to policymakers and even to the business sector. We have a grants program, we do give grants, it's not a lot, it's about $20,000 per year for, uh, for Filipino scientists uh, in, in our universities like Ateneo, La Salle, UP, and even regional universities like Isabella State University, Siliman University. And uh, we're providing weather advisories, uh, we're also have, we also have uh, uh, like a, a communication uh, work. We try to link science and business we, you know, we try to bring these two communities together because we believe that not just scientists can solve these problems, we need the effort of all sectors. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Lasso, for that very engaging uh, presentation. And now, finally, we are going to put all these things together and find ways in which we can really identify key areas that Mercy can uh, actively contribute to with the presentation of Dr. Lynn Lorenzo. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see uh, all of us here and even greater that nurses uh, are now embracing the concept uh, that is much bigger really than the practice that we've known uh, in our traditional practice. So, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for really engaging the nurses in planetary health. And uh, my task today is to discuss with you uh, my thoughts on nurses' commitment and engagement. Um, so we will uh, be looking at uh, planetary health, uh, 
definition very quickly and what I think we need to do there. Uh, nurse engagements uh, will be uh, identified uh, very briefly and also what we can do in terms of uh, nurse commitments. Finally, we will end up with the next steps or approaches that we can actually do together, uh, to, together with within countries and across sectors uh, to promote planetary health. So if you were to look at the planetary health definitions, there are quite a lot. But one that is very interesting and shortened that uh, Erwin also used in his research is that it refers to the health of human civilization and natural ecosystems where human civilization and health depends. So if planetary health uh, implodes and if it falls, then human health and our civilization as we know it will be no more. It takes into account and expands the concept of global health. So for those of us who know that what we do in our hospitals and in our communities uh, are related to other uh, countries um, and the other countries' problems, is well aware of global health. Case in point is the SARS that we've gone through uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and also case that came from China, but it circled around the world uh, and touched every nation, including uh, the Philippines. Uh, so now we know that when we take care of patients with viral problems, uh, viral diseases, we also prevent the spread of viral diseases in other countries. If we don't, then it will spread. And with air travel and other modalities that bring us closer to each other around the world, we will be at risk. And so, but this planetary health definition, while um, interesting, um, I think needs to be operationalized. If we were to give this to an ordinary nurse or a nursing student, they will say, huh? What is this all about? And so we need to operationalize this so it becomes clearer what can be done uh, and what engagement we can have. Um, so let's talk about engagement of nurses. Um, we need to move from our current nursing roles and commitments. In all our practice acts, it says that nurses must deal with individuals, families, and communities. However, our patients uh, and this uh, commitment needs to be expanded um, to have the environment as our patient or as our focus and beyond that, planetary and global health. Now, if you were to say, but I'm not concerned about that, think again because problems like um, uh, the, the, the vaccine problem that we're now facing in the Philippines, uh, the um, uh, drug-resistant cases of TB and malaria, antibiotic resistance, all of these are affected by, by planetary health. How so? Um, when we, in terms of nutrition, for example, um, we do not think that antibiotic resistance is affected by the food that we eat. But think again, the pork that you eat, the beef that you eat, and the chicken that you eat, they are all treated with antibiotics that go into uh, the bloodstream of these animal, uh, this, uh, animals, food that we consume. And it finally goes into our systems. And wonder of all wonders, when we are prescribed with antibiotics, I think that was very clear on what we should be doing as nurses. And I think uh, in all these talks about planetary health, even at, at various international organizations, really how does the uh, health sciences work together with the physical sciences and various major stakeholders in addressing uh, the climate change and various planetary health issues. So, I'm just, again, thank you very much to our panelists, but uh, so I'm getting a barrage of questions here. So that just means that our nurses are really very interested uh, in this topic. Just a quick question for all our panelists. 
how do you think can we best communicate climate change and help to our communities or to our patients? What, what's the best way? Like, uh, if we're talking about, it's very difficult to talk about the melting of the polar ice caps, the, the increasing temperature, global warming, biodiversity losses, and many others. What's the best way, in, in your opinion, can we best uh, uh, communicate these issues? Dr. Guido. Uh, <clears throat> I can really say which one is the best way at the moment, but I can make some suggestions. Uh, I think that uh, we, we should start with uh, younger people, get them into with the best uh, principles of climate change, get them to appreciate uh, what is changing, understand uh, the implications of uh, the changes. And I think that uh, they, they should be the first to, to really recognize the problem because uh, it's their future that's going to be affected the most. So I think we should start from uh, the young ones because then if, uh, you know, the, the uh, young generations uh, really appreciate that and get the ball rolling towards uh, improving uh, the emission uh, and minimizing the emission that's causing the problem of climate change, then uh, we, we would have a stride already towards the solution of the problems. And of course, we need policy makers making uh, the right decision as well about uh, trying to uh, ensure that uh, some of the basic uh, criteria for minimizing uh, emission of carbon dioxide are, are being implemented, like uh, reducing the amount of uh, emissions of using fuel. We, we, we have technology now to minimize that. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, solar uh, energy was not popular because they were very expensive. But now, especially in the Philippines, we have abundant sunlight. So that should be a key solution to the problem. So we can use green energy, which is free, and, and that should be a very good solution as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, question is, what is the best way to communicate climate change and health to the people? So it depends on our target audience. Let's say, for example, the young generation, the doctor say, the millennials. So for example, for the millennials, they are computer savvy. So the social media is uh, one of the appropriate media that we can use. Uh, most of them, perhaps, they have cell phones that have, have Facebook and Twitter. Uh, in the Philippines, we have more than 90% of the people have cell phones. So that's one uh, media that we can use. But for the community with no signals of internet and others, so we will be doing the face-to-face -face communication with them. Uh, our health workers can communicate face-to-face -face with the household by giving stories like uh, the result of big typhoons or flooding that affected the community. Now, the, the, for example, the high young typhoon that affected the uh, region of 6, 7, and 8. The experience is there, we can share, and we can attribute that to climate change. And the impact to health is also being documented and we can share. And uh, the other strategy is for the elementary school. So we can use this school environment to give orientation on climate change and health. I agree with uh, what's been said by uh, uh, my colleagues here. But think of this, think of this. You are nurses, and your patients are captive audience, right? You know, they, they're not going anywhere. They're in their beds, and probably they want to talk to someone. And so you can start a conversation like, have you heard about the polar ice caps melting? 
and I'm sure they would want to talk to you because they have a lot of time. And so I think you are in a position to influence your patients and just because uh, of where they are and essentially their captive audiences. Now I don't know how you will do it. And of course, that, that assumes you, have, you know a lot of information that you can share to them. But uh, I think you're in, 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 in a wonderful position to be able to spread the word that, that of uh, climate change and uh, biodiversity conservation. Just, just think about it. Um, that's a very interesting uh, question. In my experience, um, there, there are two ways to do this, especially among uh, students and uh, some practicing nurses. One is uh, to get them to sit down and watch film clips. Um, I recommend uh, one international one, Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. Uh, I, I, I was just told, uh, Inconvenient Truth, I'm sorry. Uh, by, uh, that was written by a group of um, uh, former President uh, Al Gore. And there's a second uh, uh, inconvenient truth according to Dr. Lasco, Dr. Lasco here, uh, which is uh, very interesting as well. Um, my Masters of Public Health students uh, were dumbfounded when we showed that to them, and they did not realize the um, urgency of climate change uh, as a problem. And then, um, because many um, of our people, your family members too, are interested in a lot of apps. Uh, and I'm sure there are uh, apps that they use like, uh, how happy are you? Or how financially stable are you? Why don't we get them to a app? How climate uh, uh, resilient is your family? And so there are a lot of scoring games, um, and some of them are very, very short, and that could lead to their realization that they themselves are in a precarious situation and are facing a lot of risk. Then there are tools that may be used by our patients and communities, vulnerability assessment tools, and maps that uh, Engineer Bonnie talked about. The maps especially are very useful. Um, when we showed communities their community maps and where the rivers and the streams were, where uh, the watersheds were, and even where the earthquake faults were, then it was easy for them to realize that, gosh, we have moved, we have agreed to move to a better place where we should reside so that we can become a climate resilient community. Um, so uh, there are a lot of these, but I think the first um, uh, the first thing is to show them um, that this is an urgent matter. We cannot wait another 20 years. The time to move is really now. Thank you very much. Which, which is uh, which is I would like to draw on that for the next question. It's like with all these issues of NCDs, infectious diseases all other uh, issues with healthcare financing, why should we be so much concerned with planetary health or climate change? So, uh, For me, um, as a health professional, the answer to that is simple. Um, we do not want to just be treating the symptoms and coming up with knee-jerk reactions to every problem that we face. We should be interested in looking for the root cause and have a chance at addressing this. Now, the root cause is planetary health, um, a lack of planetary health, I should say. And so, if we really do a very thorough analysis, it will point to that, that we have abused the environment, we have exceeded uh, a stable uh, use of uh, our um, environmental resources that will actually sustain life uh, for many more years to come. And if we do not address that, then lack of food, malnutrition will come in. Um, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance that I've talked about will come in. Will we wait? we're faced with those problems. Uh, from a public health point of view, we need to go back. And so I think it makes sense that we do. 
I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, as mentioned, because climate change could increase, for example, extreme events like typhoons. You know, three years ago we had Yolanda or Hayan in the Philippines. We can have more of those. So this is a public health issue. People will die. Thousands of people could die and uh, could, of course, uh, become ill because of climate change. We know that vectors of uh, diseases like dengue and malaria could have reached new uh, habitat, which of course could spread those diseases. And again, that could make your life uh, more difficult. Not only that, think about pollution. Like in Metro Manila, as you know, a very polluted city, and so there are a lot of respiratory illnesses. So I guess this is a very, there's a very real connection. And that is why you as health professionals, I think, should be very concerned about uh, climate change. For me, planetary health is a global health issue because um, in the global health phenomenon, it's an inter the interaction of environmental factors that affect health. For example, if we increase the temperature, as uh, what the professor mentioned a while ago, um, let's say to 4 degrees centigrade, so what will happen to the ice? It will be melted and then sea level rise and so on. And not only that, uh, it will affect air and will affect uh, water quantity in other areas, in different parts of the world, not only, for example, in the Philippines, but all parts of uh, all countries in the world will be affected, and will trans, uh, transcend to different uh, uh, climate-sensitive related diseases. So we are really very much concerned on planetary health and because of the global health issues. I think the solutions are very similar to uh, the health problems that we're having. Uh, it starts with uh, uh, having a proper diet, for example, doing exercise uh, normally. You don't end up in the hospital that, uh, that, that soon as uh, other people. With environment and, and climate change, uh, the main goal should be uh, mitigation strategies. And, and, and uh, I think uh, we have shown that uh, that's possible. Uh, we can limit the emission of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through the use of proper energy sources. Uh, we can then introduce uh, uh, new technologies that, that keeps uh, our rivers, our air uh, from being polluted and, and minimize the health effect of all these pollutions. And uh, then, uh, of course, things happen, you know. Uh, we are not perfect in terms of uh, protecting ourselves from all this uh, climate related problems uh, will need nurses then to take care of uh, their civil problems. Thank you very much. And I think to add to that, the main uh, issue here is that uh, climate change is a risk amplifier of all your existing risk factors of NCDs, infectious diseases, and all other diseases. For example, studies have shown that an increase, a three degree Celsius increase in, uh, in temperature can lead to an increase, a 35 percent increase in the prevalence of uh, cardiovascular diseases. And we're not even talking about the impacts in terms of PTSD, vector-borne diseases, and many others. Uh, there's a lot of studies in the literature talking about uh, heat stress, and in fact, there are also studies that say that cold is more dangerous than heat, right? And just imagine yourself that it gets very warm. Uh, uh, the discomfort that brings to you, and whenever there are extreme weather events like floods and typhoons, and you don't have access to your medications, right? You don't, your health behaviors are being altered because of all these, uh, these disturbances. So I guess the, the, another key message in planetary health is that um, we only have one planet to live in. If we lose this planet, there is no hell to talk about in the first place. 
And with all these advances in, uh, in, in, in our health situation, in our health indicators, economic indicators, planetary health is saying that if we do not act now, all these advances will be reversed. So, I think that is a very powerful message and if you are very interested to look into that, the Lancet article uh, identifies all those issues. Oh, this is an interesting question that I would like our panelists to address. Uh, why does eating beef contribute to climate change? Eating beef. Beef. And meat, yes. Beef. Ah, uh, it is about how cows are raised. The, the food, uh, they are, uh, the requirements for grain and the requirements for food is very high. Aside from that, uh, there is something that is uh, significant that contributes to carbon emissions. They're fart. And and I believe the methane too. And the methane too. So um, all that, if you put that together, eating beef will actually add to the carbon emissions very highly. If you reduce your beef intake um, by at least half, then all those carbon emissions and methane gas that is emitted into the atmosphere is reduced. Uh, there are many more. How you use your air conditioning, uh, how often you, uh, because of the uh, chemicals that are used in air conditioning, um, if we were to ride bicycles instead of uh, riding our cars uh, to and from work, of course here in Metro Manila that uh, seems to be difficult, that will also cut down on um, on carbon footprint. So it's a change in lifestyle, guys. What you eat, how you move, um, how you cool and heat yourselves. If you take care, if you know how you can cut down on emissions and still live comfortably, that would really be super. And, uh, yes. Go ahead. Alright, and of course, if you want to look into the literature, do you know that the agricultural industry is one of the major emitters of uh, greenhouse gases? You might, you might, what, what do you think is, uh, I mean, the major emitters? You think it's the factories? No, it's partly the agricultural industry, the transportation sector, and, well, at least for the health sector, I think we're just contributing around 14%, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Mantiba. But that's why it's, when we talk about eating beef, it's not just so that you are meat in general or even chicken. It's not just to keep yourself healthy, but it's basically, uh, it has also an effect on, on, uh, on your carbon footprint. If, if you use that app, I'll probably give it to you later, how many Earths you are using in a day, it will put into the equation how, how, uh, how often you fly, how often you eat processed meat, because of course processing needs a lot of energy, how often you are using all this uh, electricity, right? and how much that adds to your carbon footprint. In fact, the first step I use it is says that I'm using five Earths already, so <laughs> that's why yeah, it's, it's really a good app to increase your awareness. But anyway, uh, another question that we have here is, from your experience, how do we engage government more to support uh, initiatives for climate change? And health? I know in the U.S., this is a very controversial uh, issue. How do we engage our government official. Uh, Again, uh, I think uh, there are still skeptics and some governments they rely on these skeptics to then support some uh, very biased uh, political agenda like for example in the US uh, the energy industry had supported some foundations that then just, just uh, 
do research that are contrary to what uh, and, and come up with results that are contrary to what scientists have been establishing. So uh, there are all these controversies about what percentage of scientists, for example, believes in climate change. And uh, uh, it is sometimes difficult, difficult to establish one hundred percent say that this is fact as opposed to uh, a, 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 a measurement that has a high probability of being correct. And uh, we haven't really reached to the point where our, our modeling, uh, our simulation of the climate is, is uh, close to perfect. So there are always questions. We, for example, when we look at Trends that we get from model of, of the ice pack uh, over the period that we have satellite data, the models that's a really replicate of what we get from satellite data. So <clears throat> scientists has to improve on their uh, uh, credibility in terms of establishing scientists. I mean their their, their results and convince politicians that, that uh, it, th there's really no reason to believe, you know, that uh, uh, climate change is not uh, boring. Uh, that, that's one way, I think, to overcome some of the problems. And, and uh, of course, uh, there has to be a lot of education for the public, and it has to be communicated in a way that's better understood by the public so it can be better appreciated. I think the question is perfect for a World Health Organization because that's our job, to engage the government. We are engaging the government at three levels. At the global level, we have what I mentioned in my presentation, the World Health Assembly. We're in member states. We have more than 190 member countries. All of them are there to agree on global health issues. And one of the global health issues uh, discussed in 2008 is about climate change. And there, all countries are in agreement on what to do with uh, climate change and health. So all of them are signatories to the World Health Assembly Resolutions and it tied them up to do something on climate change and health. At the regional level, we have here the Regional Forum on Health and Environment in the Asia Pacific. And the Philippines is currently the chair of that regional forum. And climate change is again in the agenda as one of the issues to be handled in the uh, Asia Pacific region because uh, we have many Pacific countries, a small island, and even in the Philippines, where in climate change is a big, uh, major issue. So we have engaged um, these countries in the, we call it regional committee meeting or RCM in the Western Pacific, uh, considering the resolutions also. Uh, with regards to climate change. And at the country level, the Philippines level, we have the uh, country cooperation strategy with the government of the Philippines. And climate change is also one of the agenda that we'll be handling to, to assist the government in addressing these climate change and health issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, this is also from, um, I mean, for Dr. Magdibay. What is the WHO work plan on climate change and health? Okay, um, I mentioned um, a while ago with regards to the regional forum on health and environment and the climate change, uh, the, we call it uh, country cooperation strategy on health in the Philippines. So climate change is part of it. Actually, in the past, we have already provided support at the Department of Health in terms of climate change adaptation for health. Um, in 2012, there was already a national policy on climate change adaptation for health where WHO is part of the one who developed that national policy. In, at present level, we are um, in, co in uh, coordination with Department of Health and Department of Environment and Natural Resources and we would like to engage in greening of the healthcare facilities. 
So that's in our work plan for two years starting 2017 up to 2018. We will prioritize on reading the healthcare facilities to ensure that these uh, healthcare facilities are reducing their carbon footprints and water footprints. And also, we are providing resilient water and sanitation facilities on these uh, healthcare facilities. Thank you. So, this I think this is a very interesting question, especially that um, a lot of us are researchers in this room. So, from your various disciplines, what do you think are the key or priority research areas that we nurses can collaborate uh, with you on? areas of research that, uh, right. Of course, yes. uh, it would be areas of research or are there specific research topics that you feel that, oh, this is a, is a good uh, area for, for, for nurses to be, uh, to be involved in?
education. Um, we need to do a very extensive review of literature um, to scour uh, best practices for content that may be integrated into nursing. The problem will be, where do you integrate climate change in all our nursing subjects? And, and that might be difficult. Should we add one more course? Should we add one more year to deal with this? Or uh, can we look for areas uh, where we can integrate climate change? Um, there is already a lot of work uh, done around the world. It may not be specifically in nursing, but we could learn from that and use that to integrate in Google. And I think that's very urgent. We will have to do that. Um, Second, uh, for nursing practice, um, we need to incorporate um, climate change uh, what do you call it? interventions to make our communities, our patients, and our families more climate change resilient. And eventually, build this into practice guidelines. So, like when you administer antibiotics or when you advise a patient about a certain diet, um, what are the cost-effective uh, interventions that should be advised? And this should be evidence-based. Um, that will also reduce their carbon footprint. So like when we were talking about decreasing consumption of beef, for example, um, if you were really climate change focused, then your primary concern will be reducing your carbon footprint, right? But a serendipitous corollary for that is that it's also going to improve your health. Now, we can also see it the other way around. Are those things that we advise to promote health among our patients and communities also going to really be bring down carbon, carbon footprints and improve uh, planetary health? Um, for, for nursing interventions, no such studies have been done yet. So far, we only have identified roles and functions of nurses for planning planetary health. But it would be interesting if many of us in different settings would look at that um, and come out with uh, clinical trials of those interventions and after a few years find out if our healthier populations have indeed uh, reduce their carbon footprints through the assessment tools that they can use. Um, and maybe finally, um, I don't know how it is for the U.S. and uh, other countries, but in the Philippines, we have a national objectives for health agenda that specifies um, priority research agenda. And I think what we need to do is put climate change on that map. Um, Engineer Bonnie and I were chatting we don't believe we saw this in the new national health agenda. Uh, we have to put it there, uh, also within the nursing uh, research agenda. Just very quickly on the research uh, agenda, the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines is also trying to revise or update the research agenda for the Philippines. And this is a perfect from the uh, conversion where uh, you can also include some of the priorities for, for health. Are uh, uh, specific organizations that we're working with, like non government organizations or certain organizations that can act as entry point on, I mean, for nurses who are interested in working with uh, climate change and health?
many countries. Uh, second, um, what, I, what we have been doing with the DOH is really uh, helping communities um, try to use the tools that have been devised uh, by research a number of years ago. Um, we, together with the WHO and the Environmental Health uh, Program in uh, the Department of Health, have been uh, teaching uh, LGUs from the provincial level down to the municipal uh, levels about uh, trying to find out if they have one organizational capability to deal with climate change, second if their communities are climate change resilient and how much risk they are facing, and third to figure out what interventions should therefore be prioritized. Um, we have 1,700 um, municipalities in the Philippines, uh, and a number of that uh, should, a lot of that should be engaged now in identifying their risks. Unfortunately, we don't know. They don't know what their risks are. Um, I had a colleague who was working on uh, these climate change projects. Uh, at one point, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, when I was still at the Institute of Health Policy at uh, the National Institutes of Health, um, one of my colleagues, C.P. David, uh, came out with a tool for uh, geology and watershed. And it was interesting what he came up with. If you type in your population, your area, uh, so let's say Cebu City, and you would put in your population now, and there will be a calculation of your population 10 years from now. It will also tell you how many inhabitants there are and the density of the population. He can tell you when your potable water will likely run out. And he has convinced a lot of communities to start looking at conserving water in that way. And Cebu is one of them. They already are starting desalination of their water because there's no more water, very little water in their water table. A lot of water around Cebu that is uh, uh, ocean water. So, so things like that. But nurses should get involved in. Um, now, in the hospital, we look at our practice guidelines. I don't think we can look, we can see any climate change related, resilience related um, interventions. And the practice guidelines for malaria, for dengue, for uh, um, a lot of other diseases should include that, including the, those that are uh, secondary to heat stress. Um, again, the guidelines do not specify this. We, we all act as if climate change were not upon us yet. So nurses should involve in that kind of research. Any others from the rest of the panel? All right, so again, thank you very much for uh, this very enlightening and uh, thought-provoking panel discussion on planetary being like our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Comiso, Dr. McBibay, Dr. Lasco, and Dr. Lee Lorenzo. Thank you so much. Now, the government here, we would like to thank you. And what I would like to ask is, with the attendees who were born 1980, and, you know, from 1980 and above, would you please stand up? The young generation. If you were born 1980, okay? Okay, please, please continue standing up. Okay, now, look at this slide here. This is the message of Gina Lopez. This is the message of Dr. Roger Tongan. This is the message of Dr. Comiso. The message of the message of Dr. Lasco, the message of Dr. Lorenzo, and Erwin. We will die of old age. They will die of climate change. Okay, so these are our future. So we have a responsibility to respond to the information that has been given us today. We are on the road. So I would like to call Dina Caliente, uh, Grace Macanaria, and Ruth Dinga to thank our panelists and uh, our moderator. And you will have a chance to have your pictures taken with them to ask them for their 
thank you.
the sustained interest of the youth in the nursing profession is underpinned by cultural influence on the one hand and economic considerations on the other. For we are indisputably a loving and caring people. This culture aided many students in deciding a career in nursing, which gives them unbounded opportunities to demonstrate their genuine concern for the well-being of other people. To a great extent, our caring ways are what make healthcare institutions from around the world to look at the Philippines as a source of competent nurses. Proof of this strong demand is our yearly de deployment of almost 20,000 nurses to various countries. We expect the demand for our nursing professionals to, keep, to continue in the coming years. We have noted that countries in Europe, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and many others are experiencing critical shortages of nurses. But let me emphasize that it is the declared policy of President Duterte to generate employment in the domestic economy to enable our workers, including our nurses, to have a freer choice on whether or not to seek overseas jobs. This gives rise to opportunities for our nursing graduates who wish to remain in the country and be of service to Filipinos in need of health care. Talk about caring, we acknowledge that Filipino nurses are also in need of care. We at the Labor Department are taking efforts to afford our nurses with better working conditions. Last year, I, that is the Secretary of Labor and Employment, issued Department Order Number 182, providing guidelines on the employment and working conditions of health personnel in the private healthcare industry. This enumerates the minimum benefits they are entitled to as well as outlining main working conditions for them. Our directive is for all health personnel to be paid no less than the minimum, minimum wage and all other benefits provided under existing labor and social laws. We have also clearly specified the standards for working hours rest periods, waiting time, and work schedule. We prohibited their exposure to various occupational hazards that exceed prescribed thresholds. We require all, all healthcare institutions to provide them with personal protective equipment their rights to security of tenure and self-organization and collective bargaining have likewise been emphasized in our order. I have also ordered the conduct of visit of hospitals and medical institutions to find out and make accountable those who mistreat our nurses including those that charge training fees to nurses seeking to gain employment experience. Please note that please note that the president made it, made it very clear that the protection of the rights and promotion of the welfare and interests of overseas Filipino workers ranked high in the agenda 
of this administration. It is for this reason that I have directed the POEA and our POLOS to provide our migrant workers, including overseas nurses, with utmost protection. 